Well, looking ahead to the Eiffel Grand Prix in Germany this weekend, still some feel in the air, I think, for that penalty that Lewis Hamilton and the Mercedes team incurred in Russia. I've heard from a source close to the team that this is indeed part of what I was saying, that it is familiarity with the stewards that will make the difference as the season now progresses. What this really means is that in the old days, the Charlie Whiting days, that is, Charlie, of course, very sadly missed. If Lewis had gone to the position in which he did those standing starts in the pit lane in Russia, Charlie would have got on the radio to Mercedes very quickly and said, nah, not there. Don't do it there. Do it. Find somewhere else. That's not good. And that would have been it. But that didn't happen. That isn't happening with the new regime. And this comes back to my point. It's familiarization with the way the stewards work. Some of them permanent, some of them not. But that is absolutely critical to any Formula One team. And it suggests to me that even at the highest level, even at the Mercedes level, they're not doing that sort of homework, anticipating how the stewards are going to react to any given thing. So yeah, just reiterates the point that we were making in that video after the Russian Grand Prix. Linus Lundqvist indeed did clinch the Formula Regional Americas Championship at the weekend. So he has his fully paid Indy Lights drive sorted for him in 2021. That is without doubt the biggest scholarship in motor racing. You've got to put the W Series $500,000 prize fund somewhere near that, but not in the same class really. So for Linus Lundqvist, this is a massive breakthrough in terms of his career. And again, just reiterate the point, astonishing that more European drivers aren't following Linus's lead. Anyway, good luck to him and congratulations to all involved. That said, let's have a look now. Let's capture some of the feel of the Eiffel Mountains and the German Grand Prix. I'm going to be quoting from a book written by Bruce McLaren from the cockpit. Um, wonderful book, ghostwritten probably by Ian Young, but there's a lot of Bruce in there. And actually, the more I read it, the more I think, wow, what a guy, what a racing driver. So uh, bear with me, because this is great stuff. This is Bruce McLaren talking about the first time he went to the Nürburgring. He'd just come over from New Zealand with his mate Colin Beanland. Uh, he was working at Cooper, had to build his, there's your car, boy, John Cooper said to him, Charles Cooper probably, as they looked at a, pi a pile of tubes up on the rack, and Bruce had to build his Formula 2 car himself. And it was 1958. Bruce had come over just that uh, that winter, but he was he'd already done some races, got some entries. But by mid-July, as he says, he was feeling a bit despondent because he didn't get an entry for the German Grand Prix at the Nordschleife. So I take it up now as, as Bruce recalled it. The Nürburgring was the one track that had captured my imagination. And it looked as though I was going to miss it because I couldn't get an entry. John Cooper persuaded me to go along with the team, if only as a spectator. And Tommy Atkins offered space for my Cooper in his transporter, which was taking Ian Burgess's car. In desperation, I sent the organizers a cable requesting a place as first reserve and was thrilled to learn that I would be on the reserve list and almost assured of a start. John Cooper was morbidly optimistic. Someone will shunt in practice for sure, said John. I had just finished third at Snetterton. Ivor Buob won his list of Jaguar and the car was running well, but as a precautionary measure, and I should point out here, the car is a Formula 2 Cooper. We decided to drop the sump for a check to our horror, we found three of the main bearing caps were cracked and we were due to leave the Nürburgring in less than a week. Anyway, he goes through about all that uh, rush work being done. And then he says, um, Ian Burgess and I, Ian Burgess was another of the Cooper drivers at that point, very quick driver. Ian Burgess and I drove over to the ring in his long suffering Ford Anglia, arriving at the little village of Adenauer, just outside the circuit on Wednesday afternoon. I'd spent hours studying maps of the circuit and couldn't wait to get to grips with it. According to my map, there seemed to be only six obviously tricky corners, and I fondly imagined that I would soon be able to pick up the rest. I hadn't taken into account that the circuit runs around a choice section of the Eiffel Mountains and included many vertical hazards not indicated on my map. These made a simple curve, hidden by a hump on the approach, a trap that had to be carefully memorized to avoid breasting the rise at 100 miles an hour, getting ready for a right-hand sweep when the track dropped away to the left. So we pumped the Anglia's tires up hard and headed for the ring, joining the circuit at the entrance near the Adenauer Bridge. As the Anglia ground over the hill leading away from the bridge, I saw the circuit winding up through the forest and, with a sinking feeling in my stomach, realized I'd been taking it far too cheaply. 
Ian was hurling the poor little Anglia into the corners. It's the only way to learn, he said with a hint more of glee than apology as I braced myself in the seat. A signboard indicated a hairpin which Ian approached as though he wasn't aware of the fact. This was my first introduction to the famous carousel. Ian knew the circuit like the back of his hand. Just as it seemed we must depart through the high hedge, he swung left, dropping over the lip into the banking of the carousel at 50 miles an hour, and we bounced around like the ball in a roulette wheel. A mild application of G-force had me pinned in the Anglia seat, and as I was bracing myself for being slung over the hedge instead of through it, we were off the banking and motoring level again. The dips and rises on the main straight made the overhead bridge at the end seem about three feet above the track. I swallowed hard and closed my eyes. By dusk that evening, Colin, Harry Pierce and Peter had arrived in the transporter. Their uneventful trip included hitting a level crossing at a fair speed and bouncing both Coopers nearly out of their runners. Mine was on top and had belted down against the framework, creasing the tail. Fortunately, the high-mounted fuel pump was unharmed. Naturally, they were keen to see the circuit, so we all piled into the Anglia with me at the wheel. The Nürburgring was pretty late in the evening, the long black ribbon of road winding haphazardly through the trees, uphill and down dale, between rustic wooden fences. The long rays of the setting sun shone down through the valleys and glinted on the bonnets of the Ferraris and Porsches as drivers familiarised themselves with the tricks of the 14-mile circuit. A blue Alfa Romeo whistled by, Jean Berra. Then a Porsche Carrera screeched past on the limit into Vipperman, Joe Bonnier. I'd covered the circuit eight times before going back to Adenau for dinner and lay awake a long time just thinking about it. On Thursday morning, after a cup of coffee at the Sport Hotel opposite the pits, we found Graham Hill and Cliff Allison getting set for a lap in the former's Austin A35. A race was soon arranged, Ian and I being allowed a minute start as the Anglia was basically stock standard. We pounded the Anglia along for a mile or so, then ducked up a side road to watch the A35 howl by in vain pursuit. Graham was not to be caught out, however, and keeping an eye open saw the Anglia and gave a derisive wave as we passed. We gave chase, but skimming down into the foxhole, the overworked little Ford engine gave a death rattle with all its bearings gone. We coasted down into Adenauer to leave the car at a garage, but now it was imperative that we should find some sort of car with which to learn the circuit. The ring is one of two circuits left where this is necessary. The other, of course, is the Targa Florio, which is 45 miles to the lap. Roy Salvadori offered us the use of the Volkswagen he had rented with John Cooper and took us all for a few laps. That's a VW Beetle, of course. As we circulated, Roy described in great detail every accident that had occurred around the Nürburgring. Each hole in the hedge seemed to mark the exit of a distinguished driver, and every set of black tyre marks spiralling into the woods indicated a prelude to someone's mammoth shunt. Roy described this butcher's tour tonelessly as he held big oversteer slides, while John, Ian and I clung to the seats and privately hoped he would stop next time round. Later in the day, Ian and I did another three laps in the VW. I'd now done 16 practice laps, and although I couldn't say I knew the circuit, I was beginning to think the task of learning it wasn't quite as impossible as it first seemed. In learning the circuit, I found it essential to start memorising from the start-finish line, breaking it up into sections separated by top gear straights. Whenever we joined the circuit halfway round at the Adenauer Bridge, I made a point of closing my eyes until we reached the start line so that I wouldn't confuse myself. Shades of Sergio Garcia winning uh, in Mississippi this weekend in the big golf tournament there, closing his eyes before a putt, partly to clear his mind, partly to ensure that he keeps his head stable. There was a lot of talk about this being new, but of course, Sevi Ballesteros used to practice in the sand at night when he was a kid knowing that there was no point looking up because it was night time, couldn't see where the ball had gone, so just keeping his head still, that was the way to do it. Practice your golf at night. Anyway, it's a little bit like Bruce McLaren shutting his eyes from Adenauer through to the start line. I was a passenger on most of our unofficial practice laps, and I'm convinced that this is the best way to get an idea of the circuit. That's interesting, isn't it? As a passenger, I find one can keep looking to the side and backwards to get a better picture of the true shape of the corner than from the driving seat. Bruce McLaren. Friday was the first official practice, and after three laps warming up in the Cooper, I started to have a go, flashing past the pits, through the long south curve, back behind the pits, all of which remains on the new circuit, swinging left into the two sets of S's down through the woods. 
through the flat out right hander, up the steep hill, pull well to the left, brake and steer right, off the ground over the rise, right, left and swoop down to the sharp right hander before the foxhole. I was really getting with it at this point, but suddenly had a funny feeling that something was wrong. As I swung right, the feeling strengthened. There was a sudden shriek of tyres and puffs of rubber smoke, and I jerked round to see a van wall front wheel almost in my cockpit. Don't forget Bruce is in the F2 Cooper at this point. My biggest worry was that the wheel was still connected to the van wall and connected to the steering wheel of the van wall by one hand was an irate sterling moss. In other words, he'd given him the chop. His other hand, in use as a fist, was being waved violently in my direction and continued to be all the way down through the foxhole until I lost sight of the van wall. At this stage of my career, I regarded Sterling as the head prefect. I knew him and he knew me vaguely, but that didn't stop me getting balled out for mistakes. I stopped at the pits, hoping that my little mistake would forever be a secret between Sterling and myself. But Harry Pierce, looking upset, said, Moss is looking for you. Sterling didn't find me that day as I made myself very scarce. Bruce went on, would you believe, to finish fifth overall in the Grand Prix and to win the Formula 2 class of the German Grand Prix 1958. This is how he describes the last moments of the race. I put my foot hard down trying to forget about the Porsche which was being driven by Edgar Bart and, think, and thought only about the car in front. I was relieved when the signal board showed a five second lead on the Porsche. Next lap I'd drawn out nine seconds and then phew, I took the chequered flag. I slumped in the cockpit and took a few big gulps of air, slipped into neutral and coasted through the bottom curve and back to the pits. When I stopped, I tried to uncoil my left hand from the wheel and found I couldn't. It was stiff with cramp from not being shifted during the race all the gear changing on the right, of course. Feeling very proud of myself, I was led to the victory dais, not podium, and stood beside Tony Brooks while the British national anthem was played twice. Brooks won in the van wall, followed by Salvadori, Trantignor, Von Tripps, myself, Bart, Burgess, Formula 2 Cooper, Marsh, Cooper, Phil Hill, Ferrari, Formula 2. I'd also managed fastest Formula 2 lap at 9 minutes 37 seconds. Colin Beanman placed a laurel wreath on the nose of our Cooper and we grinned at each other as we pushed it towards the paddock. Not in our wildest dreams had we ever imagined anything like this. Jack Brabham thought it was a huge joke. I don't know, he's had a couple of Kiwis come over with three spanners and a spare wheel just to fill up the entry list and they win the bloody race. Um, later I heard about the first of John Cooper's famous victory somersaults. When Roy took the flag for second place, it was the best placing the works had gained in a Grande Prix. Of course, already they'd had victories, but with the Rob Walker Cooper with Maurice Trantignon and Sterling Moss. And unable to contain himself, John Cooper turned a somersault on the track. Hushka von Hanstein, the Porsche racing manager, walked up with a large cine camera under his arm and asked John to perform it again. I'll do another somersault when the F2 Cooper comes around in front of your Porsche, laughed John. And of course he then had to. <laughs> and then would you believe Bruce had a race at Brands Hatch the next day? So we need to just cover that. One, one race was over for the day, but another was just beginning. We had to catch the midnight boat from Ostend to get back for the Formula 2 race at Brands the next day. The Anglia had been repaired in that garage, so Ian and I bundled in and set off for Belgium, while Harry, Peter and Colin were going to load up and leave as soon as they could, joining us on the midnight ferry. With about 20 miles behind us, the engine of the Anglia developed a light tap. After 60 miles, the tap was heavier. By the time we had reached Liège, it was a loud knock. We stopped and took the spark lead off to lighten the load on the delinquent bearing. This quietened the noise considerably, but it returned again in full force as we reached the Jabaki Highway and eventually we came to a grinding halt. It was 11 o'clock on the night of the race and pitch dark and we spent three quarters of an hour trying to pick up the headlights of the Atkins transporter. Having flagged Harry down and tied the Anglia on behind the transporter with an alarmingly short piece of rope, we bounced into Ostend at 60 miles an hour, just in time to see the ferry sailing. The Anglia was bequeathed to the RAC man at Ostend, and after bundling our bags into the transporter, we crammed the five of us into the cab and set off for Dunkirk, with Harry bunched over the steering wheel. It was like a Hollywood version of motor racing, with the laurels in the cab, the two cars bobbing in the back, and Harry thrashing the lorry along with great gusto. We reached Dunkirk just in time to catch the 1 a.m. ferry and try to sleep, but it was hard to unwind after such a day of excitement. We reached Brands Hatch at about 8 o'clock the next morning, and it was easy to spot the people who had been to the Nürburgring. They were sleeping on blankets, under transporters, or curled in the back seats of parked cars. I was totally exhausted and made a vow that I would fly back from the ring in future.
but I did finish third in the race at Brands. Plenty of references there to the master, to Sir Sterling Moss. I thought I'd end with this video I found on the AP archive, which you can all go to. Very little seen video shot with Sterling in about, I would guess it's early July, maybe late June 62. So he's had his Easter Monday 62 accident and he's on crutches and they're talking to him about whether he might make a racing comeback, how he feels. And uh, yeah, and I just love, <laughs> I love the way Sterling handles it. Sterling, we're hoping to see you at the British Grand Prix at Aintree later this month. Do you feel that you might be able to compete? Well, uh, quite honestly, I feel that I most likely could if I was going to be a bit of a fool, which I've done before. That's why I'm a racing driver, really. But uh, I think it would be silly to try. And um, I do believe that I'd be far better off to take a holiday, get tanned, and at least look healthy, so I can kid you people, and get rid of these things and be able to walk and run and ski and do the other things that I like doing. Twisting, for instance. You see, the thing that people don't quite understand, in fact, I didn't understand, I mean, I don't blame them, is that, uh, unfortunately, I bang the old lid, you know. And uh, if you bang your head, you get contusion of the brain, which is one of the things, which means, in other words, it sort of went and twi twisted out of place. And this happened, and therefore it does slow up quite a lot of the things. Perhaps you'd like to hazard a guess as the winner of the Grand Prix. Oh, I can tell you, yeah. If it rains, it's going to be Graham Hill. If it's dry and he lasts, it's going to be Jimmy Clark. If, if he doesn't spin off, it will be John Surtees. And uh, all things be equal, well, maybe Jack Brabham, which you know is for. And the twist, of course, is a reference to the new dance of the time, Chubby Checker, let's twist again. Good old style. And of course, the British Grand Prix that year at entry was won in the dry by Jim Clark in the Lotus 25. Well, that's it for this midweek espresso. I look forward to seeing you on Friday when we'll be reviewing FP1 and FP2 from the Eiffel Grand Prix in the Eiffel Mountains at the Nürburgring. Don't forget, that is when a certain Mick Schumacher, who's currently leading the FIA Formula 2 Championship, will be making his weekend Formula 1 debut for Alpha in FP1. See you then.